see. Got height and down. Yeah, okay, that's very good. Yeah, that'll work. Whatever. It's, it's not quite how I do it in dance, but. Oh yeah, right, right, right. That's right. And in the same, but in the same order. All right. Thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome to our presentation today about the growing edges of primary, secondary OER and open pedagogy research. My name is Dr. Connie Blumgren, and I'm here with my uh, graduate students and colleagues. So um, we'll each introduce ourselves and provide our land acknowledgments. Um, so to keep it short, I come from Treaty 7 in um, south of Red Deer all the way to the American border if you go by colonial markings, but actually it goes right into the United States, into Montana where I am. Very beautiful country and I love it so deeply. So thank you for being here today. Um, uh, I'm Sarah Hammersheim, I'm an ED candidate, and I live in Denver, Colorado, and that is the land um, that is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations and people. So I recognize these indigenous people as the original stewards of the land in which I live and work. My name is Jody Barber, and uh, I am a second-year doctoral student. Um, I live in northern British Columbia, where I teach secondary science, and I live, work, and play on the unceded territory of the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en nations. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Pascovicius. I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, uh, and I live on the lands of the Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees. Osanich and Esquimalt people. And I am a, a, a professor in a faculty of education uh, and uh, moving towards supervising graduate work and very interested in the work that's being done in open education. So we wanted to bring forward some people that were interested in um, open educational resources, um, open pedagogy, and that growing edge of research and the need for research to support policy, understanding, and also applied research for practitioners in the field as scholar, academics, and as practitioners, those interrelated roles. So my contribu contribution has been, um, as part of my research and study leave this last year, um, I curated or asked or tapped on the shoulders of different people that I know from different networks to see if they were interested to contribute a chapter in a book um, that has a fairly straightforward title. Um, it's just um, Open Educational Resources for K-12 Classrooms. There's seven chapters and um, it goes really from the Alberta context uh, to the um, regional sort of and then to the national in Canada because there is really very little OER happening in Canada or in Alberta. There's little pockets here and there and to help nurture those spaces I thought that a book that uh, contributed to that knowledge would be useful. And then the second part of the book is uh, the next section where I went to sort of a, uh, widening out the circle. So there's a chapter there by Royce Kimmons um, in the United States, and then also Barbara Suits from um, K-12 OER in Washington State, same state where Cable Green is, where there's been a lot of work in K-12, our primary, secondary education. And then uh, a very beautiful example from Norway with the um, NDLA and all their contributions of not just creating OER for teachers, but having a really practical, in, and in my opinion, a very beautiful model that we could adapt and readjust for our different contexts. So I see the book as a contribution to that whole broader discussion of how can we have K-12 done properly for different people in different parts of the world. And Sarah. Hi, 
Um, so this is the title of my uh, research proposal that I defended at the end of the summer, and I'm in the midst of um, applying for ethics, and then I'll move on to data collection. But I'm looking at open pedagogy, OER, and an active curriculum in K-12 classrooms, and I'll be doing a hermeneutic phenomenology. In addition to being an ed student, I am also um, a teacher librarian, and I work in a middle school in Denver. So I'm kind of a practitioner and then also a scholar. And when I started kind of my journey, I was thinking about OER and how it relates to K-12. And of course, um, as we've heard up through these days, and, and, and as I know, K-12 OER, it's, it's, it's growing, but it's pretty small, the use of it. And I thought as a librarian, I could investigate how li teacher librarians are helping teachers. And, um, but it, it gets a little complicated when there's not that much to curate, and, and my teachers aren't using it. And, um, and so then I uh, kind of encountered open pedagogy in my doctoral studies. And so I was looking at Haggerty's model of open pedagogy with her eight attributes. And, um, and working with teachers who are super creative and engaging, uh, creating engaging lessons for students that are very uh, student-centered and student voice and choice are really elevated. And, and I was seeing these attributes of open pedagogy in these classrooms, right, but with, without the open learning materials. And so I was trying to put my mind together thinking like, there's OER, there's open pedagogy, like in higher ed it seems like we have OER first and then maybe open pedagogy, perhaps in K-12 is it open pedagogy first and then OER? Like what's, what's, what's really the relationship here? But I got really excited um, when, I, when I encountered open pedagogy. So then my thinking kind of branched to both and I thought, well, when, I, when I'm gonna do research, I wanna combine the two of them. Um, but there was still like a, like, a, like a missing piece I felt. Like I, I thought, what's, like what's the what's the story here that I'm trying to tell, and and what piece is missing? And um, this spring and summer, I, I I branched out in my reading and I started looking at curriculum studies. And curriculum is really the language of K to 12, um, especially in the United, at, at least in the United States. And so there's really two schools of curriculum. There's a a much more kind of scripted version or this Tyler rationale where you start with objectives and and then you have like learning. Um, activities and then, and then there's assessment. But there's also this other school that are the reconceptualists. And um, these individuals are seeing curriculum as like embodied and it's an enacted experience and it's co-created between teacher and learner and learning materials. And I encountered um, this design capacity for enactment framework by uh, Matthew Brown. And so this is a way to show how teachers are engaging with curriculum resources. And as I'm looking at this and, and reading it, I'm thinking, well, this kind of is reminding me of the five R's, of like how are teachers modifying OER, but it's language of curriculum, it's not open language. And, um, and then I uh, was reading about, this is a study for, of mathematics curriculum by Jenna Milliard, and she has this enacted curriculum framework. So there's tons of different curriculum. There's written curriculum, there's planned curriculum, there's the official curriculum from the district or from the state. And, um, but this enacted curriculum is what happens when a teacher interacts with a student in the classroom with learning materials and everyone's contexts are coming together. And I thought, well, this is like the co-creation of learning happening here is really enacted curriculum, but yet like it's, it's not open language, it's curriculum language, but to me, I was seeing all the ways that these pieces could connect. And so I thought, oh, okay, here I can do a study of OER and open pedagogy in K-12 classrooms and see if teacher experiences line up with what I'm imagining they might be in this enacted curriculum model. And so I plan on interviewing K-12 teachers in both Colorado and Washington State, so Colorado where I have contacts, and Washington State which is a forerunner, um, and, and kind of teachers all across the grade levels and, and different curriculum just to see what their experiences are to capture their voices um, and to help better understand what's happening in those K-12 classrooms. And I think that's me. That's it. So, and if anyone has any contacts, let me know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I'm pretty early on my journey with this uh, 
right now. And um, what I've noticed so far is that K to 12 OER use and OEP adaptation, um, it's a really big topic, but not a ton of research. And um, so I'm just gonna go over some of my observations uh, and, and some of the questions I have now with a little bit of experience that I have um, at this point, a little over a year into my doctoral journey. So from a current viewpoint and personal experience and all the reading I've done, um, OER is not uh, being well used in K to 12. Uh, and, and I know there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, I did a, a paper on this um, earlier in the year and the feedback I got was time, 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 nobody has enough time. And um, I recognize that time is an issue, but um, I, think, um, I think that it's not the only issue. Um, a lot of schools have textbooks and, um, and while they're outdated, they're still just convenient to use if you've been using something for a long time. Um, you know, you just, you're just gonna keep doing that. Um, teachers often don't know about OER repositories and, uh, and those that have tried uh, are often um, disappointed. You know, it's not always easy to find information that, um, that you can grab and, and fit into your work right away. Um, I think that while many teachers are um, comfortable sharing resources just within a district or within a school, um, there's a bit of fear uh, on sharing more globally. Uh, and um, and I, I think that a lot of teachers don't know about the five R's. They don't know about open licensing. Um, it's just not even in, uh, in their sphere. Um, but, uh, but I think that the benefits of OER can't be ignored, and reducing the cost of education uh, for school districts is a part of that. Um, our school district had, uh, I don't know, 15 to 20 year old Science 9 textbooks, and um, we were able to order one class set of new ones this year, and we can order one class set next year and the year after um, until we have enough um, for, for our school's needs. That stimulated some thinking that I'm gonna get into a bit later. Um, but there's also the ability to contextualize and individualize learning and, uh, and in particular to uh, incorporate more local indigenous content. Um, and also to create uh, more inclusive education. And as a person with a disability, uh, inclusiveness is, is close to my heart. So, um, so I have questions and I have things I wonder about at this point, and I'll just go through a few of those. Um, Aris and Hoy put out a paper earlier this year um, where they, uh, teacher candidates were being instructed in OER use and taking that out to mentor teachers in their practica, and um, I thought that that was um, really interesting and obviously had the potential to inform the practice of mentor teachers as well. But what I wonder is if, if um, teacher candidates are, are incorporating OER into their uh, instructional design, their practice um, at the front end of their career, then that just becomes a part of everything that they do. And it seems to me that that would reduce the, the, the time issue. Um, it wouldn't be an add-on anymore, it would just be a part of practice. So I think that's a really interesting research. Um, because my focus is K to 12, I, I think about the fact that K is a long way from 12, and, and how, does, how does OER use and OEP open pedagogy, how does, how does that change between K and 12? What does openness look like in primary grades? Um, I think it looks more similar to higher education uh, in grade 10, 11, 12, so I'm, I kind of wonder about that. Um, I, I wonder about where openness intersects privacy. Um, privacy is a, a really big thing when we're talking about minors and putting, putting their work out there. Um, sort of wondering, you know, where does, where does that meet? And, uh, and then what about parents? Like, do parents fit into this at all as well when we're talking about children that are six or seven or eight or, or even 15? Um, for sharing, I, I wonder about professional development for uh, teachers to learn how to 
share in smaller local repositories and see if that spills over into, into larger repositories and to help populate them. Uh, and I guess finally, I, I have a project coming up um, in response to our district's inability to acquire hard textbooks for the grade nines is um, I've got a little innovation grant in our district to, to try to create uh, an open science nine textbook. And the more sessions I've gone to while I've been here, the more I think maybe that was a dumb idea. <laughs> but, um, might be a bit more work than I'm anticipating, but I, I'm going to dive in and, and do a whole bunch of learning for myself. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, anyway, that's just some of the things that uh, I've been thinking about um, early, early in my journey, um, but I'm um, pretty excited about moving forward. Thank you. So it's clear the enthusiasm and opportunities uh, enabled through open education are there. And we, we've experienced a lot of these in higher education. Um, and part of my work is in teacher education. And so there's a perfect professional development opportunity to get um, an opportunity to practice and integrate uh, open practices into uh, teacher workflows. And so I've, I've been in this job only for a few years now. Um, but I'm finding my way uh, to think about the, the, the course I teach in technology integration and building in open literacies uh, so the teachers start from a place of openness, not have to figure it out as they, as they get uh, further down the road. Um, and we're just making small inroads now, but, um, and as has been said, it's, it's all new to, to, to future teachers and often technology is not their most their greatest interest. Um, but if you can bestow the possibilities and perhaps uh, the ability to save a little bit of their time in those early years when they're trying to either um, fill in as a teacher on call or um, start a new class, I think there's so much potential with um, open education. So I'm really excited about it. And I'm really excited to work with other teacher educators who work in this space who are uh, tackling the similar issues. We, I think, speak different languages, but talk about the same things um, between K to 12 and uh, higher education. Uh, one of the key focuses of our district and perhaps our province is, uh, is around inquiry learning, around letting learners uh, drive their learning based on their interests and finding ways to connect that to curriculum. And you find learners much more engaged in their learning when they can make some choices about the topics and the, the resources that they might want to bring into their, to their learning. So I feel that there's just a perfect match between inquiry learning and the potential offered by open education and just finding the ways to cross talk between what, what our teachers are already doing and um, making sense of that uh, to prepare future teachers to to have an impact on, on the practice. So we have um, called for your input. There's a couple ways we've asked for your input and I'm gonna make this quick because I wanna get to questions if there are any. Um, we first have found each other in um, the w Western Canada, but we're, we're hoping to connect with more educators. So there is a, um, there is a form you can fill out. It's a Google form. If you don't like Google, you can actually email. There's an email there that you can uh, join this group as well. We're not sure exactly what form it'll take, but we'd like to just have the ability to connect with other people who are interested in open education in K-12, whether they're in service, pre-service, or um, uh, looking to make inroads in other ways. There's also attached to this presentation on the SCHED a Padlet. And so the questions in the Padlet are looking at what opportunities and challenges do we see in K-12 open education? What are the significant research needs? That would be really useful to, to have some input on so you can contribute to that. Some people have already contributed and I just want to acknowledge um, folks have said that there's an abundance of places to publish openly and so there's places for teachers to locate and if they wish, share, which is a great opportunity through Merlot and OER Commons in our context, among others. Uh, there's Climate Action OERs Ready to Go, which are absolutely essential in early grades to start thinking about. And some of the challenges mentioned were the big tech permeation. I don't know about your district, but um, 
organizations like Google, uh, Apple, others have a lot of inroads already and um, can create some challenges to sharing. And some other contributions involved, um, OER really meets local context as has been mentioned. And so there's a huge opportunity to get local knowledge expressed through open educational resources to meet the needs of our local contexts. So we really invite you to consider those questions, uh, perhaps um, contribute to the Padlet and join the network. And um, we'd love to hear from you and love to uh, take questions, I think, if, if there are any. I understand it's been a long day. It's a little hard to see, I'm sorry. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for all your information and presentations. Uh, I'm Jenny Heyman, probably everybody knows me because I ask a lot of questions. Um, I'm wondering if there is a strategy or a possibility of working with long time in service teachers and administrators in OER and uh, in K-12, uh, because those folks would not have had as much exposure. I know there's great probably fodder in, in working with pre-service teachers, but what do you think might be done with those folks who, are, who have more power, actually? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, and my experience, Jenny, is anyone who's interested to just listen to what I have to say about open educational resources or open pedagogy, I'm going to help them understand. I th what I've encountered, and this was actually Christina Ishmael who works now, um, I think she's the, I, I'm not full, I think she's ex executive vice, what, what, I'm not from the US, so I'm not too sure of her full title, but she's, um, you know, second or third person at the U.S. Department of Education related to um, technology and openness. And Christina told me, and she's done a lot of all sorts of meet up, meetups throughout the U.S. with all sorts of educators in the K-12 system. And uh, she said she quit using the word OER because she said, what I think happens is that people here education and they hear resources and they go oh I know that that's my world like you know I, I started out as a classroom teacher and then eventually move up to you know being principal or superintendent or even a minister of education and I really think that um, it's a it's a question of helping people understand awareness before, as part of, right? Because we often want to run to the creation piece, um, but it's also building awareness. And Barbara Suits from uh, Washington State also told me, she said, I will be doing OER awareness for the rest of my career, right? Because that's what she's doing, right? It's just, so I think it's finding those, those sweet spot, uh, pockets of possibilities. One thing that's nice about pre-service um, teachers, um, Michael, you'd probably have something to say if you want to about this, is that pre-service teachers own their intellectual property. So when they go in their practicum and they're teaching, you know, learning many things, their intellectual property, their lesson plans belong to them. Whereas under Canadian copyright law, as soon as you sign a contract with the school board, unless otherwise discussed or negotiated, I, it's not that, it's not the, that's not the legal term, but that's essentially the meaning under the Canadian copyright law, is that you can have permission for open licensing, but it's a conversation that should be occurring between yourself and your employer and their designate. And so a classroom teacher and then it's also like, well, when do you create those classroom um, materials? Like, is it, you know, if it's for a class that you're teaching, but it's like next year, and you're doing it during the summer on your own laptop, 
whose property is that, right? It starts to become kind of a slippery kind of issue there. So it's about copyright literacy. It's about uh, trying to help people who have a have lots on their minds, and also it's not oppressing in their, it's not top of their mind. Right now in K-12, to mental health is a huge topic. Um, of course, uh, you know, trying to support students with uh, any kind of diverse learning needs, that's a huge topic. And so it's really moving ourselves also from the closed copyright publishers way of thinking to, you know, where I always say, what year is this? What year is this? It's 2023, people, like, wake up. We're almost a quarter of the way, you know, into the 21st century. And I have a friend who keeps saying, oh, that's so last century. Oh, that's so last century. And so that closed publishing model is so last century. So it's, it's, a long, complicated story, obviously, Jenny, but I, I, just, I just randomly try and plant seeds, create cracks, plant seeds, and hope that some of those little seedlings grow to be bigger. And they do. They do. Um, I feel really lucky to be uh, in a small but pretty progressive school district uh, up north, and um, and I think having a superintendent and assistant superintendent buy-in is really important. Um, when, when I submitted a proposal um, for uh, a small grant to, to do the work with the grade nine textbook and, and incorporate um, our local indigenous knowledge and all that, um, they were jumping up and down with excitement. Um, and, and I'm hoping that that'll filter down into more professional development uh, at our school. Um, but at the same time, if, if you give somebody ex something extra to do or learn, you need to take something away. And I don't, I don't know what that other something is going to be or exactly what the process is. But I think if you, the higher up you can start, the better opportunities you have for trickle down. Uh, uh, I come from the state of Colorado, and there's a very active uh, open education community there, mostly for higher education. But it is trickling down um, to the K-12 space. And just as an example, I work for a very large school district uh, to, the, to the west of Denver, and um, they've just adopted a new math curriculum. And I know that it's open, but that has not been kind of what the school district has said anything about, and the professional learning is not structured towards OER and, and open pedagogy, which feels like a, a, a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, but it, it's interesting to see how OER is, you know, coming to coming to my state, and in fact, it's already there. Um, but uh, just thinking through ways of like, how do you, you know, make those cracks and plant those seeds. And, and I, as a librarian, I know that there are some teachers that are a little bit more forward thinking or will be willing to try new things. And so it's that uh, knowing who to approach, knowing who to come alongside, knowing who to walk with, and then what kind of support that they'll need. And so I'm kind of that ag advocate at my, at my building level at, at this point, but you know, maybe in the future I, it can be an advocate at a different level. So. I think we're beyond our time, so I, I will just thank everyone for your attention and your interest, and that doesn't have to end here. Certainly you've got two graduate students who are gonna be doing some really exciting research, and I see Joanna at the mic, so let's go to that question. We'll, if, We'll just talk at Norquest, maybe, or later tomorrow. Anytime. I've got some very, yeah, I'd love to talk more. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.